talk about outer space. Hello, I'm Jenny Slate, and today we're going to talk about Arno Penzias and Robert Wilson and their beautiful cosmic discovery. This is my dog's uh, penis. And then I've also had his uh, balls removed. Oh, shame, Red shame. Dude. Give me back my balls. You can't have them. I took them away. <laughs> but I have a full vagina. <laughs> In 1960, Bell Labs made this like giant listening device for NASA. But then by the time they were ready to use it, a better thing had been built. So then it was just like by itself, all by itself in New Jersey, a lonely horn. But two scientists, Arno Penzias and Robert Wilson, they were like, oh, whoa, oh, oh, whoa, hold on, hold on. If no one's using that, could we use it? They were like, come on down to the horn. So they get to the horn, they're like, we are beautiful scientists with lovely minds, and we want to listen to the sounds between the stars. Boink, they're like, let's go, babe, let's listen up. <laughs> oh god, I love thinking of them calling each other babe. <laughs> so they listen, and the sound is a hundred times louder than any sound they expected to hear. It's like, <laughs> the universe is like, Find out about me. So they're like, what is this darn sound? <laughs> it's coming from everywhere in the sky at once. Everywhere, everywhere, everywhere. And then they're like, no, there's no way a sound could come from everywhere at once. So we have to eliminate all the other sounds that might be like interfering. So first they thought maybe someone doesn't care about science. They're like, it must be coming from, you know, New York, urban interference. You know, New York is a city with buildings and lights and people and subway and blah, blah, blah. So they're like, point it there. Pointed the horn at New York City. No, that's not what we're hearing. Forget about you, New York. Maybe it's coming from a military base nearby. And then they just like pointed at the military bases, but they didn't hear that noise coming from there. No, it is int. <laughs> so then they're like, okay, next. Maybe it's from the sun. They pointed at the sun and the sun was like, I'm just the sun, I don't give a shit. They're like, it's not the sun. What the funk is this, man? And then they're like, we should check our device. What if there's something inside of this thing, like, you know, mold or a skeleton of a hobo that crawled in there to get shelter <laughs> or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> they look inside the horn, guess what? This f***ing thing is filled with pigeons. Houston, we do have a problem, and it's pigeons. <laughs> <laughs> Arno is like, you do it, Robert. You f***ing kill them. Robert's like, I don't want to do it. You do it. <laughs> guess what they did? They shot them with a gun. A shotgun. And then they were like, well, that'll do it. <laughs> After they wiped the bird blood off of their hands. They're both like, RIP these pigeons, let's do this. Boink. They start to listen. They're like, oh, sh <gasps> They hear it again. What the hunk is this right now? <laughs> <laughs> they don't have the answer. They don't know what to do. They listen through the horn for years. They're going through their papers, their papers, their papers. Ugh, uh, uh, uh. I can't get it. Ugh, uh, there's nothing here. <laughs> Ugh, this one's boring. Ugh, this isn't another language. It's being like, we're never gonna figure this out. Finally, they find a study done by a scientist whose name is Dicky. <laughs> He had this crackpot theory that the universe, instead of being infinite, actually started at some point. Dickie's like, 13.8 billion years ago, AKA old as f <laughs> Check your watch. I think the universe started with like a crazy explosion, AKA the Big Bang, but they had no way to prove it. Then these two guys from New Jersey who've been listening to this fucking pigeon shit horn, <laughs> call him up, they're like, we hear this thing, it's like, <gasps> have you ever heard of that before? He's like, oh my God, that's it. This is what we've been studying. Cosmic microwave, what is that word? What is the word? We know it, what is it? Cosmic microwave background radiation, okay? It's the sound of microwaves from the Big Bang. 
And they're like, yeah, it's it, it's it, we got it, we got it. This is basically the sound of the Big Bang. They wanted to try to find anything, but what they found was the sound of everything. I had to unfollow NASA on Instagram because it made me too crazy. It would just be like, this is a picture of a fucking black hole. And I was like, ah! <laughs> okay, let me tell you this. Penzias and Wilson get the Nobel Prize for Physics. Everyone f***ing flips out and they were like, yes, the Big Bang is real. It happened. It's real. You guys did it, Penzias and, um, and, uh, oh, f the other guy. I just keep thinking of Winslow, but I know that that's from Family Matters. Carl. <laughs> Carl Winslow discovered the Big Bang. Derek, what this is right here, this is the sound of the echo of the universe being created. <sighs> Suck on that for a second. See how you like it. Just for a second. The universe is like, just suck on it for a second. <laughs> <laughs> and the f***ing universe is suck on it for a second. The year is 1963. Gordon Cooper, he's this military test pilot from Oklahoma. NASA had just begun, and so he was one of seven astronauts chosen for Project Mercury. Also really chill, he was like, please call me Gordo. Don't call me Gordon. I'm not that official, right? And so all these space missions go off without a hitch, and NASA's like, we've done really well. Congrats, NASA. And they're patting themselves on the back. And Gordo's like, guys, I totally get it. Like, that's really cool. Like, pats on the back. But if you want to send a man to the moon, you should maybe see if someone could be in space for, I don't know, 24 hours. And NASA's like, ugh, yeah, I guess. Gus. Yeah, sure, Gus. Gordo. Oh, shit. Sorry, I'm in there. It's OK. All right. You're fine. So Gordo goes on the launch pad. NASA would be like, hey, just like really quick, like don't touch anything. NASA would completely control everything. It was so bad that the astronauts felt like um, spam in a can <laughs> is what they referred to themselves as. So anyway, he launches into space and it's like three, two, one, blast off. <laughs> Are you shooting that? Okay, good. He gets up into space and everything's cool. He's like, I'm orbiting the f***ing Earth. Oh, I'm sorry, I work. You can swear. No, my mom, I try not, I'm not, I'm gonna try not to swear. So he's in space. He sends back the first TV images of a human back to Earth. He has a little powdered roast beef dinner. He's just having a bowl. So he takes a nap the first guy to ever sleep in space. He wakes up and he's like, it's good to be Gordo. And then he's like, oh, no, it's not because beep, beep. Oh, I have no stabilization unit. Everyone on Mission Control is freaking out. They're like, oh God, this doesn't look good. And Gus Grissom is like, bro, I love you. I'm gonna tell your wife. You're a hero. Gordo's like, no, stop it. I'm gonna take control over the spaceship. Gus is like, you're about to do something none that no one has ever done before. And Gordo's like, yeah, no, I know. So just shut the f up, Gus. I've got control. And he starts to take over manual control. But at that moment, he loses radio signal with Gus Grissom. And so he gets a radio signal over to his friend, John Glenn who's on the recovery boat over in Japan. And he's like, John Glenn, hey, it's me, Gordo. Um, I have absolutely no power in my spacecraft, and I just want to get back home because I'm a really chill guy. It's me, Gordo. And he's like, OK, here's what we're going to do. And so together, they go through this checklist. Uh, put this thing up, like press this button. There's all these things he needs to do. But then Gordo's like, oh, sh and his carbon dioxide meter's going off. And it's like, beep, beep, you're f***ing. And he's like, oh my god, you're right. I'm totally f***ing But I, no, but he's chiller than that. No, hold on. He's way calmer than that. John Glenn, look, 
my carbon dioxide meter's going off, and uh, it's like 100 degrees in my cabin. Which means he's dying, but he's not being a Debbie Downer about it. He's like, I need to get to Earth. But like, manual reentry had never been done before. So if he enters Earth's atmosphere too steep, he's gonna blow up. So he says, okay, there's the Big Dipper, there's the Little Dipper, Gemini. He draws an axis on the window and uses the constellations as his constant. And he says, this is going to be my angle at which I can enter Earth's atmosphere, which I think is pretty incredible. So John Glenn is like, okay, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6. Gordo's like, let's just like do it. I'm ready. So he fires a... Uh, what does this mean? <laughs> What's it called when there's fire coming out of stuff? When when it's like a fire. Oh. <laughs> he fires the rockets. He had a five dollar wristwatch, and that's what he used to figure out how long to fire his rockets. Gordo is like, I'm entering Earth's atmosphere. F***ing bravo to me. Wait. Oh. <laughs> and he splashes down, and he has the most accurate splash down ever in NASA history. He's like so chill. He's like, hey guys, I made a. I'm not surprised. It's me, Gordo. Big whoop. Gordo changed the game. Great. He had a $5 wristwatch. To every not. Cosmonauts and astronauts. All the knots. Not. Hello, I'm Kyle Kinane, and we're going to talk about the first spacewalk. It's 1965, space race is underway. America, it's Russia. So Russia, they've been sending animals out. Poo! But then the US, they sent a monkey up there. Poo! And then Russia is just like, who's the most maniac Russian we have? Pavel Baliev and Alexei Leonov. So Russia says, Pavlov, Alexei, do you want to do some ape stuff? We would like you to be the first human beings to do a spacewalk. EVA, uh, uh, electorally, e extra vehicular activity. Imagine what it's like to be floating around in the 80s, except this is the 60s. And they, and they go, what do you got going on with your life? Nothing. Same here. Uh, yes, yes, I'll do it. Missions called the Boskov 2. And so Russia's watching on TV. Finally, Russia's got something like, awesome. Good luck with your rock and roll in your, in your beach, boys. We got this. So the launch, it, it pops off, man. The launch pops off. It's good. And so then they're like, we did it. We're, we're in orbit. Lena pressurizes the suit, pff, leaves the airlock. I'm floating in space. I'm floating in space. I did the best thing I ever did in my life. He's the first human being to do so. Everybody's watching TV. This guy's out there. The whole country's, oh, we did it. We're the best. The first secretary, Brezhnev, is like, Leonov, good job. A little belchy. Not Barfy, don't worry, don't worry. <laughs> so Lena was like, okay, I did it. Can I get back into this craft? Oh, I can't even fit inside of it because the suit blew up too big. He's got filled, he's filled, the suit's <laughs> filled up. He's stuck. He's like, oh, I f***ed up this whole thing. So they cut the feet, they immediately cut it to Mozart's Requiem which is some depressing funeral jam. <laughs> I'm, I'm assuming right now you'll play it, right now. And it's just some sad 
But then Leonov secretly realized he can real he can he found a nozzle. So we had to to depressurize. Yeah, his temperature his temperature spikes. He's almost got the bend. Nearly kills himself just to get back inside to the spacecraft. He's in. Oh, oh, that should be the most of it. He's in. And then they can't get the hatch closed. Like not like 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 sitcom style. Nothing's gonna go right. It's, it's, these guys. Oh, sh Why am I looking at this one? Should I be looking at anywhere else other than this one point of the couch? <laughs> so so anyway, they take the hatch. Great, fine, great. But that throws balance off of the whole goddamn machine. So they're stuck twirling around. So Leonev says to Pavel, we're like, we gotta land this right f***ing now. They're, try they're trying to figure out, they're trying to like calculate the trajectory to get back, just land on Russian soil. If we land in, if we, if we land in China, that'll be f***ed up because of something that Wikipedia tells us. They twirl towards the earth, and then wait, whoa, whoa, kaboof. We landed. Oh, man, we should get out of this capsule. Oh, oh we got, oh, we got, we can't get out. We can't get out of this capsule. We should blow the doors. How? With these tiny explosives we're provided with. Oh, good, we're out. Oh, where are we? Over the tundra. Oh, don't do that, don't do that. I know. I know how TV works. All right, they land 2,000 kilometers off their mark in Siberia, which is a real place. In the middle of mating season for wolves and bears. It's below zero temperatures, wolves, bears, all oh, just boners. Jesus. Look in the fuck. You know, all I can say to each other is, well, I guess we should start with some sweet kisses. <laughs> well, but how much more? Well, what happened to them after? Derek, Derek, don't say nothing. Yeah, I just want to get what? It's, the... They're in Siberia. They're blessed and flares out. They didn't have food or sprites. And then, after 30 hours, they find finally they got rescued. I don't even believe it. Ah, oh, they're just some lunatics that said yes to an experiment. Cosmonauts, astronauts, any kind of not did yes. The knots, yes. The knots said, why not? <laughs> what a what a what a button. What a button. In 1969, America lands on the moon. And every America's like, oh my god, we land on the moon. It's amazing. And Michelle was like, uh, hold up. That's all white dudes. What the f right? So she gives this big speech and she's like, NASA. Get your shit together. Can you please recruit someone to be an astronaut who's not a white dude? And NASA's like, okay, cool, but like, can you do it? Cause we don't know anybody who's not a white dude. So Nichelle Nichols is like, ugh, black ladies have to do everything. So she travels around the country and she recruits people to be in NASA. And she's like, hey, black people, Asians, lady people, do you wanna go to space? And they're like, okay, cool. And she recruited Sally Wright. And then she recruits Colonel Buford. He's the first black dude to be in NASA. How cool is that? And then she recruited Mae Jemison. And she's like, hey, you should apply for NASA. And Mae Jemison is like, oh my God, you were on Star Trek. I love you. But she's like, pay attention. So Nichelle Nichols was like the first black lady to go to space for fake. And she recruited the first black lady to go to space for real. She literally integrated space. Everybody who's really good at math or whatever you have to be good at to be go to NASA can do whatever they want to do. But we still need to prosper if we're going to live long. Yeah. <laughs> Is this America right now? It's yes. trying so hard. But, <laughs> but it can't but get over. But this ring finger just can't deal with it. <laughs>